Welcome to Indigenous Voice. My name is Joy Hamilton, your host. Um, this is an hours program dedicated to First Nations here and abroad. Um, I am a visitor of this territory. Originally, I am from the Cree Nation of Stanley Mission, Saskatchewan. I grew up here in Victoria and have spoken publicly for First Nations concerns and felt the best way to have a voice is to create many voices. Today on our program, we have an author named Lee Tassie. Welcome, Lee, to our program. Thank you. It's nice to be here. First, I just wanted to say that um, I am a visitor of this territory. Originally, I am from the Cree Nation of Stanley Mission, Saskatchewan. I grew up here in Victoria and have spoken publicly for First Nations concerns. And I feel that a voice is to create many voices. Lee, can you tell me a little bit about Green Blood Rising and what what was it that made you want to write this book specifically? I have a very strong feeling about the earth and animals and trees and well basically the whole earth and I don't like what's happening to it mm -hmm. and so I decided I wanted to write about the trees taking over and what would happen to the human population if they did take over. That's what started it. Okay. I noticed that in the book that um, it's written in the year 2050, is that, That's is correct. that correct? Yeah. So it's sort of uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, why in the future? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I suppose because I wanted a little bit more um, technical advancement. Mm -hmm. um, and also the reason that the whole thing starts is because loggers go in to cut down the last, the very last old growth on um, not Carmana, but very close to there on the west coast of the island. I see. And so because it is the last old growth stand, it had to be further in the future than, you know, say 2020. Could you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? And, uh, um, you know, what, what made you, what prompted you to write the stories that you've written, especially Green Blood Rising? Uh, I grew up in northern BC. Uh, in a very isolated area and uh, because I, it was isolated I couldn't go to school I had to take school by correspondence mm -hmm. and because my brother and sister had left home long long before um, I really didn't have anybody to talk to uh, except my parents and they were quiet so I talked to animals and I talked to trees and I spent a lot of time wandering around the, because it was isolated, there were, uh, the closest neighbor was two or three miles. I see. And in this area, the, the, there's sort of no one to be um, Cree territory, isn't it? Yeah, there, there, are, there is a Cree settlement in Hudson Hope, which is not very far away from where I was born. So is this sort of what gave you the idea of um, some of the characters that you have written? Uh, yeah, partly, that was partly it, and also partly because I'd read quite a bit about uh, the Cree Nation. Mm -hmm. And I felt very much in sympathy, mm -hmm. and I thought they would be in sympathy with me because of how I felt about the Earth and about taking care of it and giving back, uh, giving back to it or taking care of it anyway. Mm -hmm. Because you have a very strong... There's, when I read the book, I felt that a very strong connection of, of spirit. There was a lot of spirituality in your book, mm -hmm. um, especially where, where, where the granny, where the grandmother was concerned. Mm -hmm. um, she's very lively and she, she, she talks about having to, um, how she was taught her traditions. Mm -hmm. and it has gone to her daughter and then to her grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been many, uh, the whole book 
is sort of based in my, when I read it, mm -hmm. more on the spirit of, mm -hmm. of First Nations, of, of the Cree yeah. um, ways of, of um, their traditions. Yeah. Well, it is based on Cree philosophy. I didn't think about the word spirituality at the time, but it was the Cree philosophy of how to live and how to live with all the other living creatures on earth. And that fit with how I felt. Mm -hmm. And so if that's spirituality, then, yeah. then that's what I did. Uh, Lee, could you please tell, tell us a little bit about why did you choose Green Blood Rising? What was the basis behind that? The basis is that humans have red blood, trees have sap, which I call green blood. And I discovered that idea um, in a book by a biologist called um, uh, Donald, sorry, I can't remember his last name, but um, he talked about green blood and red blood. And so I thought, if the trees are going to take over, are going to fight back, I want to say that their green blood is rising. It's like a, 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 a people rises up in, and um, rebels. Okay. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting in your book is that the grandmother, Granny, Granny Drake, mm -hmm. she talks about vision quests and she, t and she tries to teach not only her daughter, Sunny, but she also teaches her grandchildren about how to live off the land, how to um, go and do a vision quest. And, and as a matter of fact, one of the characters go, go and actually do that. And for some of you viewers who do not know what a vision quest is, a vision quest is typically a rite of passage or marks tradition in life, the death of some part of you or your life, and making space for something new. So how did that come about? Why did you feel so strongly about writing that into your book? I felt strongly about it because two of the characters <clears throat> in the story are teenagers, three of them, and they've suffered a, a great shift in life because after the trees um, create, they, they create in themselves a stronger electricity, and so <clears throat> it means that you can't log anymore, you can't touch a tree with metal. And they also start growing everywhere that they grew 5,000 years ago, and growing very fast, which means that um, the transportation is ruined, trees are growing up through lawns and uh, in airports and on streets, so there's no transportation. And <clears throat> it takes three days for the grocery stores to be emptied, and then there are gangs out raiding and so on. So these kids are, have retreated to the farm with their family, mm -hmm. and they're having to learn how to deal with no school, no friends, and when the electricity goes, they're having to deal with uh, no cell phones, no TV, no lights. So they're really lear learning how to live off the land with, with no technology. And um, Lakin, who is six, 16, is quite upset by all this. And she says she's unhappy with herself and un unhappy with everybody around her. And Granny has talked to her about Vision Quest. And she said, she, Granny suggests to her, why don't you meditate? And Lakin says, that's too slow. <laughs> it has to be fast. I want to have an extreme experience. So can I go on a vision quest? And Granny says, are you afraid? And Lakin said, yes. And Granny says, that's very good because you'll pay attention to what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. You won't just walk around blind. So that's why L Lakin went on her vision quest, which was um, four days and nights in the woods with no food, no water, just a sleeping bag. I see. Yeah, and that's, 
That's very close to what the Cree philosophy is, because actually when young people, and especially, well actually it's more so with young males, I think, mm -hmm. um, traditionally they will go on a vision quest. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of almost to mark them coming into the world a new person, or, or like, a, like a young, young man. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this young girl is doing the same thing, but she is coming, going to come out of it a very strong mm -hmm. young, young woman. Oh yeah, she does. In the end, Granny makes her an elder. Which is, which is awesome, which is exactly yeah. what happens when you, when you actually do these mm -hmm. spiritual quests. Yeah. It's good for your heart, your soul, your mind. Yeah. And what I liked, what I wanted to do is to have Granny teaching the young people the mm -hmm. right way to live, the right way to look at things, like an elder would. Um, when you're talking about where you um, had the idea of the book, you know, I know that you're a local writer. Mm -hmm. um, and can we talk about Whitty's Lagoon? Because that was where you wanted to have the basis of the book, yeah. wasn't it? And well, you actually made a, a beautiful map for it, which unfortunately we don't have. But could you talk about that and why Whitty's Lagoon? Yeah, Whitty's Lagoon is a setting. And that's because I have spent so much time walking around Whitty's Lagoon and through the park, Tower Point and then the Wooded Park. Uh, I thought that it was it's a perfect spot if you want a homestead because there is a fi there was a five acre farm I think that's three hectares uh, right behind Tower Point which is now park so that um, a family living there could have animals and could grow things of course they're right next to the sea mm -hmm. so they could go fishing um, so they have everything they need everything that they could possibly have in order to make a life. Uh, and of course, simply because Whitty's Lagoon is beautiful. I see. Lots of wild, I, get, I don't know if they're the original trees or not, but all along the park, they're beautiful arbutus and oak. And mm -hmm. Because there's one area there where they have a beautiful house. There's a beautiful house that stands almost right in the middle Mm -hmm. And is that, and that is, that is... Um... Yeah, that was where I put uh, the family house. It's okay. not that house because in 2050, a more, lot more people have built uh, earth sheltered homes. Yes. And so it's set right into the hillside. And from the north, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. But of course, on the south side, it's sheer window to allow the sun to come in. Right. So that's where they get their heat. Um, and the the farm the farm that's there. I think the house is still there. Unfortunately, they're subdividing that. Yes, unfortunately. My favorite they are. five five acre farm. Oh, <laughs> but it, it, that whole area it, that's become the community, yes. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And the the people who live there have taken over deserted houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's a subdivision on the west side, uh, you have to walk through the subdivision to get the for to the forest part of the park, yes. Woody's Lagoon Park. And there's subdivision there, and then houses on other little streets right. around that farm. And so that's where the where the Macho the Machosan community lives. I see. So how long did it take you to? <laughs> To have to like decide that this is going to be where this person lives, and this is going to be where this takes place, and um, did you just? Oh, not very long, because what I did was get a, a map of the whole area yes. of Woody's Lagoon. I downloaded it, and then I took it to Staples and had it enlarged about four times, <laughs> and stuck it up on a bulletin board. And every time I wanted to find a house for somebody to live in, I would go figure, look at the map, and figure out where it was, and draw the name on it. Right. <laughs> so how long did it take you to develop this? Like develop the whole thing, the maps, the, 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 you know, the ideas, everything? Well, the idea was originally in a short story. That was just the, that was the very beginning of it in the 90s. Um, 
I sort of wrote the story on a bet about what would happen if the trees um, took over. And that was published in the Canadian uh, called Short Story Magazine, which mm -hmm. sadly is no longer. So I had that idea, and then I had people who read it say, but then what happened? Right. And uh, you know, I, as a writer, I can't resist that. Right. And I wanted to know too. Right. So it probably took me three or four months generally to plot out in my head where I was going with it. I see. And then writing the book was probably about a year. A year? Yeah. Okay. I did a lot of research. I did a, an incredible amount of research on <clears throat> how to live without technology, mm -hmm. on uh, drying food, and uh, how, where to get water if you couldn't pump it. Mm -hmm. um, anything you can think of to as to how you would live if you if you could not burn trees because you couldn't cut them down right mind you you can cut them down with a stone axe right. but it takes a while but I think um, I think it's you learn a lot from this book oh there's yeah. so much about this book mm -hmm. that when I read it, and I've read it again, over again, that, um, you know, it, it, if you've missed something, well, you're going to pick it up the second time. But it's, it has so much to do with learning about how to deal with yourself. Yes. You know, how strong are you mm -hmm. as a person? And will you be able to, to live like this? Like you said, taking away everything that you've ever known yeah. and have to start from scratch. And that's exactly, in a lot of ways, where, where you know, First Nations people had to do that. They do that. Mm -hmm. They live off the land. They live from scratch. Mm -hmm. And they've learned to, to, to you know. Well, I know, when I was a kid, I wanted to meet First Nations people so they would teach me how to do all the things I didn't know how to do. Right. <laughs> so you basically had to grow up on your own. Yeah. Yeah, which you've obviously done very well with yourself, you know. Well, it helps if you have a lot of time to think Yeah. and be with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, in the modern day, there are so many distractions, particularly electronic distractions. And I mean, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I can get out the phone and play solitaire. <laughs> I know you're doing, you have sequels to the books. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what the next what the next books are? Of course, um, the next the next one is called uh, Red Blood Falling. It took me a while to figure out how to get blood in there in that title, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a murder in the book. Oh, uh, it's <clears throat> the same community, the same characters in the same place, but it's twenty years later, and there is a murder committed, and. Uh, they don't have a lot of trouble finding who did it. Of course, there's not very many people around. Uh, but the big problem is, what are they going to do? How is justice going to be served? And the third one is Shockwave. Um, and it's a survival book in, a, in the sense that they have to survive what's called the big one, the big earthquake. Okay. The earthquake doesn't do very much damage, but the tsunami does. It takes out a couple of houses from the community. And um, one of the characters who was 10 in the middle book is now in her 20s, and she's having a problem coming to terms with who she is. So it's her doing that and surviving in a, in a good way. I see. So, so basically, the, the, this all um, again is survival. Yes, techniques, mm -hmm. and it goes more into <clears throat> both books. Go more into what they have achieved. Um, they now have feasts, and they're they're dealing with other very small communities who, that mm -hmm. have survived, and um, they dig a pit and roast uh, sheep and deer. Oh, and they do their hunting bow and arrow. Right. 
because all the ammunition is gone. Right. And that's also when they learn <clears throat> that um, you may not be able to touch a tree with metal, but you can touch a tree with a stone axe, which is what primitive people used, you know, what, 100,000 years right. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so it takes a long time, but you can cut a tree down if you have to. Right. But they use mostly driftwood and dead trees for fuel. Mm -hmm. So they've had to, again, go back to the beginning yep. again, in, like in these, these next books. Um, and it's sort of a continuation of their survival. Mm -hmm. One of the things they did for their survival in the first book was that the, uh, the main family collected as many books as they could from universities um, all over the place how-to books, you know, how to remove somebody's appendix, presumably, <laughs> <laughs> um, how to preserve food, how to do everything they could think of. Mm -hmm. And so this one house is more or less insulated with books, floor to ceiling. Oh. <laughs> and, and of course, they develop a way to educate their kids. Mm -hmm. They have a school, one room school, mm -hmm. one room in the main house. Uh, they go on foraging trips with the kids, picking, um, oh, dandelions. Because, you know, you can make uh, wine from dandelion flowers and salad from dandelion leaves and coffee from dandelion roots. I see. I know there's a lot of, um, there's a little bit of humor and comedy in, in your books as well. Oh, I can't resist. <laughs> <laughs> because... There's a lot of serious things. There's a lot of spiritual things. You've, you've put in a lot of everything into your books, which, which makes it really interesting. And I'm really hoping that the, you know, people that are listening will have a chance to be able to read these books and be able to get these books because mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. I can well, tell I had you've a had a lot of fun doing them. Doing them yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and Granny's got a good sense of humor. She does. Yeah, she's very she's practical. Very, and yeah, she's a very wise person, isn't yeah. she? So, Lee, I just want to say thank you very, very much for coming on this program today. Thank you. It was nice and to I be here. And I wish you all the luck in your future thank endeavors. You. Are you uh, still writing up a storm? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I'll and what never is stop. your net? What is your what is your book that you're focusing on today? Um, it's science fiction, um, set far, far in the future, in the 3000s. Um, and it's about one character who overcomes incredible odds. Right. Uh, and there's humor in it. <laughs> there is? Oh, good. Well, thank you, Lee, for coming on the program today. Thank you. And thank you for watching Indigenous Voice. I'm Joy Hamilton, your host.